Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to the um, to the selection committee and to the Royal Society for um, having us all here today. It's truly an honor for me to be here to present my my research to you all. I should move the slides. There we go. My name is Marina Aku, and I'm a final year PhD candidate at the Olivia Newton John Cancer Research Institute here in Melbourne. And um, today, I'd like to talk to you about a part of my PhD um, work, which was really looking at um, how we can. Um, harness, better harness these gamma delta T cells um, as potential new immunotherapy targets to treat colorectal cancer. And I have a very beautiful image on the background of this um, slide that you can see here, um, which kind of, sorry, it's a bit blocked by my name and everything else, um, but it's, it's, it's basically that disorganization of colorectal cancer at a cellular level, and that was taken by, um, by Kelly Tran, who's a, a, an RA in our lab. Um, using some multiplex immunohistochemistry. So the problem is colorectal cancer, and I'm sure I don't need to give this topic too much of an introduction, but um, we know that it's now the second leading cause of cancer deaths here in Australia. Um, we have approximately over um, 15,500 cases diagnosed each and every year, and there are just over 5,000 people dying each year um, in Australia from this disease. So that's just over a third of those that are diagnosed. Just to put it into perspective, because I know sometimes we're so desensitized to numbers, that number, 15,000, is the Rod Labor Arena. So whoever comes and enjoys the um, Australian Open each year, like I do, imagine that entire arena full of people are diagnosed each and every year in Australia. And more recently, there's been a significant increase in the incidence of early onset colorectal cancer. So this is colorectal cancer being diagnosed by people that are 25 to 49 years old. So this is the younger population that previously, were, it was very rare for them to, to um, have this disease. So increasing incidence in the younger population, huge problem. Um, and, you know, even without the younger population, it's still a huge problem problem um, in the over 50-year-old. So it's something that we really should um, address. Now, um, one of the most recent treatments for cancer in general, which has really been amazing in, um, in our weaponry to treat um, patients with cancer, has been immunotherapy. And unfortunately, so immunotherapy is, is a way, it's a treatment that's given to cancer patients where basically your immune system is just tickled enough to just switch on again and say, hey, look, you've got cancer, please kill that cancer. Um, but unfortunately, in the case of um, colorectal cancer, we have patients that respond, but we have a significant amount of patients that don't respond. In fact, less than 10% um, of colorectal cancer patients actually respond to these treatments. So these are the more safer, more um, nicer treatments that are kind of available on the market for cancer patients, and yet they're not as, um, as useful for, for this cancer type. And on top of that, a significant amount of those pa patients that actually do respond, they um, experience significant off-target side effects. So these are side effects whereby um, their immune cells begin to attack even the healthy cells. And so then they start to feel um, they get neuropathy or um, uh, gut issues, for example. So um, quite, quite an, an, a nasty sort of um, response to these treatments. And this really creates an urgency, um, I suppose, to, to develop new targets that are really specific for colorectal cancer. Because I think now we're heading into um, um, a research you know, era where we've realized that not every tissue in the body is the same and we can't treat it in the same way. And that's particularly important for cancer. So just to um, give a recap of immunotherapy here. So as I mentioned, um, immunotherapy, it kind of tickles our immune system, but the particular immune cells that I'm talking about are, are these T cells. And I'm sure we've heard a lot about them recently during COVID and everything. So your T cells are the ones that are really the action sort of, sort of um, uh, immune cells that are ready to go. They'll kill anything that comes in their way. But sometimes they fail and that's when immunotherapy comes in. And what you can see is that um, by giving them a little bit of a tickle, they get activated and they produce these killing um, properties called granzymes, where they're able to attack their, um, their target, which in this case is cancer. What I'm really interested in, though, is that, so these cells, these T cells, are your conventional T cells. I've always had a, a little um, knack for the unconventional, and I'm really interested in our unconventional T cells. So these are your T cells that not many people um, um, 
know about. In They've only really recently been discovered in the last 100 years or so. And these T cells are, um, are unconventional because they don't use the same pathway to kill their host, their target, sorry. So they they don't need to be um, you know primed or let or or made aware of what their target is. They can do it on their own. So to me, I like to call them like they're like the Rolls Royce of our immune system because they're quite rare, unique, and they're very strong um, killers. And so when we look at where these T cells are present in in the in the human body. Um, when we look in blood, which is where the majority of our conventional T cells that are the current targets of immunotherapy, um, gamma delta T cells actually make up only about one to 5% in our, in our um, blood. And so not very many, right? In fact, um, where they're the most abundant and where they're very much enriched is actually at our barrier surfaces in, of our body. For example, our gastrointestinal tract. And so, um, within our gastrointestinal tract, they make up between 30 to 40 percent of our immune cells. And they're predominantly found, as I mentioned, at these barrier surfaces, and so they really act like the guards of our barriers. And in this example here, they act like the guards of our gut lining. They protect the host from any um, invading pathogens. They can sense, um, you know, changes in our diet and nutrients and can um, protect our epithelial barrier, so that wall that really keeps that you know, the outside out and the inside in. Um, and they're, as I mentioned earlier, they're ready to go and kill anything that comes in their way. And so naturally, we ask the question, well, if they're present in this environment, and this is the place where these cancers that I'm interested in, so colorectal cancer occurs, so what's their role then in colorectal cancer? What's the role? So. What we did was we looked um, firstly in some human patient um, tumor biopsies. So these are from our collaborators at the Austin Hospital. And basically, um, these are stage three colorectal cancer patients. And just to explain this, um, this graph for you um, a little bit. So the blue line represents um, where we see, um, oh, sorry, it's a little bit the opposite. So the, yeah. So the, the red line is representing where we see increased um, gamma delta T cells and therefore better survival of these patients. And then the blue line represents the decreased gamma delta T cells and therefore um, reduced or poor survival of patients. So this is how many gamma delta T cells we were able to count in tumors of these patients. And then we were able to track them um, for that many days and see that the increased number of gamma delta T cells present in a tumor meant that that patient was better off um, moving forward. And these are treatment naive, so people that are not on treatment. This was um, when they first were diagnosed. We used preclinical models, and we found um, in, a, in a situation where there are um, gamma deltas present, we see smaller tumors, and where there are no gamma delta T cells, so we genetically modified some mice to remove gamma delta T cells from these mice, we saw greater, um, bigger tumor, tumor burden. And so we really wanted to understand the biology of these T cells a bit more, and particularly in those environments, so within the, within the colon. Um, and so what we did was we decided to actually look throughout the entire GI tract because it was very interesting for us to see whether, at diff even within different parts of the GI tract, do we see differences in these, in, these, um, in these gamma delta T cells. So we did some single cell sequencing where we can look at the genetic makeup of these cells. Um, and we wanted to ask the question of what immune cells are present in different regions of the GI tract. Um, and here is a, a little map um, that visualizes that whole bunch of data. But basically, this map just shows you the, here are all the cells that are present from the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. And what I'm highlighting now in orange for you are the immune cells that are um, in the stomach. So you can see that they all quite cluster nicely together in what looks like the map of Australia. Um, in the immune cells um, in, in yellow, these are from the small intestine. And where I'm really interested in the colon right here are the immune cells that are found within the colon. So that kind of looks like Europe, Asia, something like that, like one of the continents, yeah. And so when you look at them as a whole, they definitely make up this immune cell world map, right? So we wanted to say, okay, well, now highlighted in red here is 
where do we find our gamma delta T cells? And if you, if you look back at this map, it's very much predominantly in the small intestine and the colon. We don't see any gamma delta T cells in the stomach. So they're very important, clearly, in that specific area. And so <clears throat> what we really wanted to focus on now is, well, what are the differences in this, these cells between the two colon and the small intestine? And what I have here for you is a heat map, again, from that um, single cell RNA sequencing data, where we're looking at the DNA makeup of these cells. On the left-hand side column, don't worry about the details, but on the left-hand side column, if you look at it from far away, that's the small intestine, you see the red um, chunk of genes at the top, those are upregulated, so increased in the small intestine compared to the right-hand side where it's really blue, that's the colon. So those are distinct differences between the small intestine and the colon. And some key genes that we were able to find in those were some killing machinery that gamma delta T cells produced to be able to kill tumors, such as granzyme A and granzyme B. Interestingly, at the bottom of that heat map, we also see that dichotomy. So some um, genes are increased in the colon and some are, and they're decreased in the small intestine. And those genes were actually, one that I'd like to focus on is a molecule called TCF1. So we were really interested. Do you, is my stop for? <laughs> so what we were really interested in was to see, um, you know, in these two different environments, are the gamma delta T cells acting differently as well? So this was all based on their DNA, their genetic makeup. So what we um, what we did first was really look at what are the differences at these organs. Just take a step back and just have a look at biological differences. And what we saw, well, what we know, obviously, is that the small intestine, you can see, even just histologically, their structure is quite different. They have these really finger-like projection um, villi that project out into the lumen, whereas the colon is um, um, more stumped in, in that sense. The colon harbors the largest body of microbes that are found on or within our body. So these are my, um, microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, and fungi, which, are, which live in symbiosis with us, and they're very good for our health. Um, and also, the colon actually is more prone to cancer and other diseases, whereas a small intestine isn't. So when we compare these differences, it was really interesting to see that in terms of gamma delta T cells, we have very distinct sort of populations of these cells. While they're the same cells, they're very different in, in the way that they look and the way they act. So what we wanted to know was that molecule that I mentioned, TCF1, is it controlling the killing potential in the colon for gamma delta T cells? And very quickly, what we were able to show both in human cancer um, patient tumors on that side there, but also in preclinical models, was that when you genetically delete on the right hand side in the, in the preclinical models, when you genetically delete TCF1, specifically in the gamma delta T cells, you have reduced tumor growth. And that's, you can see that here where there's visibly no tumor compared to where there is a tumor in the gamma delta T cells that are TCF1 positive. Um, and we saw the similar expression here. So in humans, we saw that where there was TCF1 positivity, they were able to, um, they weren't able to produce um, that killing machinery I mentioned. Whereas when they're TCF1 negative, they they are able to. And so really this highlights just how um, unique and promising these gamma delta T cells are, and particularly when we look at them in specific areas, like for example in the small intestine, we know that when they're TCF1 negative, they're able to produce killing properties and molecules like granzymes, and these are important for tumor killing. Um, whereas in the colon, we have higher TCF1 expression, and you know we have sort of shown, and a paper has recently been accepted for publication in Science Immunology, where now um, we know that TCF1 is suppressing the killing of those gamma delta T cells. And so really, the, the future of this is how can we make these TCF1 positive cell, gamma delta T cells in the colon more TCF1 negative so that they can produce these killing machinery that they need to, to um, limit tumor growth. And ultimately, I started off with a slide that was a colorectal cancer, but now here's a slide of healthy colon. And, and I guess that's a really cliche way of me saying that throughout my PhD work, but also the amazing work that a lot of people do in this field, we really hope that the overall outcome is, is just better um, results for patients and their families so that we can hopefully improve their lives and make them live longer. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge everybody, um, all my supervisors, and this is definitely a team effort, they say, um, it, it takes a village, and it definitely does, even for a PhD student, not just a child. Um, and so I appreciate all the funding support and um, all of our collaborators. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>